Hi, I'm Lynn Cornell, and welcome to Journey Through the Bible Verse by Verse. Grab your Bibles and follow along as we study through each book of the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Now, I'm using the Holman Christian Standard Bible, so if you're reading from a different Bible translation, the read is different, the message is the same. We're going to continue in our study in the Gospel of Mark, and we're in chapter 12. Um, Jesus is still in the temple complex. He had just been confronted by the Pharisees as to who gave him the authority, um, presumably to drive out the money changers. So in other words, this is still the setting here. So verse 1, then he began to speak to them in the parables. And remember, a parable is a, a, a story to illustrate truth. Um, and I think that's the key word to always remember it is a story to illustrate truth. Yes, it's illustration, but it is also to illustrate truth. In other words, it's truth nevertheless. Verse 1, he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it, dug it out, dug out a pit for a wine press and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and farmers and went away. And at harvest time, he sent a slave to the farmer to collect some of the fruit from the vineyard, from the farmers. But they took him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent another slave to them. And they hit him on the head and treated him shamefully. Then he sent another, and they killed that one. He also sent many others. They beat some, and they killed some. He, he still had one to send. A beloved son. Finally, he sent to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenant farmers said to, said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will those owners of the vineyard do? Will they come and destroy the farmers and give the vineyard to others? Um, but he will come and destroy the farmers and give the vineyard to others. Verse 10. Have you read this scripture? This, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came from the Lord and it is wonderful in your, in your eyes. Now, <clears throat> um, let me, um, I'm going to read verse 12 too. Uh, verse 12. Because they knew he had said this parable against them, they were looking for a way to arrest him, but were afraid of the crowds. So they left him and went away. Okay. Um, very simple illustration about the parable here. The, the, the parable, and, we, and, and oftentimes we have explanation in other scriptures. Remember Mark is a very abbreviated gospel. So from the Old Testament you can see the illustrations of how the term vineyard is used in the other gospels. Uh, they give more explanations. So the vineyard is Israel. Okay. Then, the, of course, the vineyard owner is God. The slaves represent the messengers of God, such as the prophets. What is also interesting about this is it reveals the nature and motivation of the now the current leadership, the Pharisees. It also reveals the, the ongoing problems with the leadership those who were entrusted to take care of the property of God, okay, or the vineyard owner. In other words, the problem with the, the those who the slaves were sent to, it wasn't their vineyard. And so this last one even comes out and says, he is the heir, come let us kill him. And I guess thinking that they're going to retain <laughs> uh, another man's vineyard. That's the problem with that. Of course, the vineyard represents Israel. Israel is God's nation, God's people. So at best, even the Pharisees, okay, the Pharisees would um, be tenants, would be those who are instructed to watch over the property and then yield the fruit when the owner comes. But they're refusing to do that. All right. And again, notice they knew that Jesus spoke this parable against them, which means they have no conscience in terms of their guilt or their sin. Uh, verse 13, then they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to him to trap him uh, by, by what he had said. Now, Herodians were more of a political sect 
the Pharisees were a religious sect. Um, the Herodians, in a sense, probably were from the King Herod camp, which is interesting because they hated each other, especially when, when, you, when, you, when you think in terms of the Pharisees, because the Pharisees considered themselves very pious. But yet here they're uniting to eliminate a common enemy. Verse 14, when they came, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one. Flattery, of course. <laughs> For you don't show partiality, but teach truth, truthfully the way of God. Now, you know, it's, it's, you know this is flattery, just cunning lies, because if what they just said is true, then why aren't you believing it? Why aren't you submitting to it? That, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or should we not pay? Now again, they were trying to trap him. See, in other words, either answer. If he, if he had said yes, they would have charged him with blasphemy. If he had said no, they would have charged him as an enemy against uh, Rome. He says, but knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. So they brought one. Whose image and inscription is this? He asked them, Caesar, they said. Then Jesus told them, give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. And they were amazed at him. Now, I kind of picture in my mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I would want to be dramatic about this. If I had the coin, just toss it at him. Give to Caesar and with Caesar and with God was God. All right. Verse 18. Some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and questioned him. Now, the Sadducees were were the larger part of the Sanhedrin. You had the, you had the, um, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, and you had some couple other groups that, are, that, that made up this ruling body. The, the, the Sadducees were probably the larger part. The Pharisees were the more influential part. But notice, they would be what we would say today are the progressive party. But notice this, although they believed in the law of Moses, however, notice, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in, um, in a supernatural part. So that's why this, what Marcus, you know, the, the writers say this in preference of, then why are they coming with this argument? So verse 19, teaching Moses wrote for us that a man's brother, if a man's brothers die, leave his wife behind and leave no child. His brother should take the wife and produce offspring for his brother. Now this was the Old Testament practice. Even really before the law, they practiced this. And the idea was to keep up the brother's seed so his name wouldn't die out. Okay? Verse 20, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and dying left no offspring. The second also took her and died leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. So, uh, seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died too. In the resurrection, who's, uh, uh, when they rise, whose wife will she be since the seven had married her? And Jesus told them, are you not deceived because you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Now concerning the, the dead being raised, haven't you ever read in the book of Moses and the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him? I am the God of Abraham, the, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are badly deceived. Now, <clears throat> uh, now, uh, this is flawless, flawless, um, I think flawless apologetics on Jesus' part. They were so foolish to think that they could craft an argument in which they themselves, of course, don't even ascribe to. They don't believe in. And that yet Jesus, again, tells them how absurd their position is. That he's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Now, what, what this sort of means here, consciousness, existence is forever for every person. And then life becomes quality. In fact, Jesus would go on to say that. Eternal life is knowing God. 
And thus he crushes, I mean, this is uh, uh, the way he does that. I'm going to stop here. And I'm going to pick it up in verse 28 and finish out the chapter because it, it goes into another question that I'm going to get into. So I'm going to pick it up in the next video. I'll see you then.